So there are many reasons that people walk away from church. Maybe some of you have had periods in your life where you have walked away from church and then come back. Maybe you're still in the process of walking away, or maybe you're contemplating walking away from church. And I think that one of the the main reasons I hear why people walk away from church is because of sin and hypocrisy among Christian leaders, where Christian leaders don't line up to the biblical standard. You can think of, if you follow Christian news, that the pastors who have flamed out of ministry for immorality in the last few years. There's been a a lot of prominent pastors. You can think of Mark Driscoll, James McDonald, Robbie Zacharias, where much of what they were teaching was solid, but then when you looked what was going on behind the scenes, that there were patterns of sexual immorality or bullying or ungodly behavior in different ways. And so for people in those churches, in those ministries, that can be extremely traumatic. It can be spiritually damaging. It can call into question people's faith in the church, in organized religion, in clergy, and sometimes even their faith in Christ, that it can can rock people's confidence in profound ways. And that's why the, the topic of our passage today as we continue through the book of 1 Timothy and 1 Timothy 3, is so important because this chapter in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is about the the moral qualifications of leaders within the church, of of elders, of, of deacons. And this is crucial because it's actually how Jesus tells us to recognize the difference between a false teacher and a true teacher. In Matthew 7, verses 15 and 16, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. In other words, you will recognize the the true teacher by the, the fruit of their lives. And you say, well, what is the fruit that you are to look for? Well, you could look at the fruit of the Spirit that we see from the Apostle Paul, but especially when we consider leaders, it's what we will see in this passage. This is the the fruit, the picture of what godly leadership in the church should look like. This is what we are, are longing for, aspiring to, what we want to see in the church. And if only what we see in this passage were true of pastors across the board of of churches, of of leadership, there would be so much grief, so much sadness, so much pain that would have been spared for the church, but that sadly has been the case because of what Jesus said of the the ravenous wolves that come into the church. So again, grab grab your Bible and turn to the book of 1 Timothy and then look at verse 1. This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, He must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we we pray that I would be able to teach this passage truthfully. Lord, that we would see this reflected in in churches, and leadership, 
that I would see this reflected in myself as a leader in the church. But also I pray that as we walk through this, that we will see the, the relevance, the power of this, the importance of this for every single man, woman, and child in the church. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I talk about leaders in the church, um, it's important to define what we're talking about. Often different churches will have different structure. That The word that is used is polity for church government. But as we read the New Testament, there are two ordained offices within the church. And you actually see this at the very beginning of Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, the book of Philippians. He addresses the overseers and the deacons in the church, these two groups of leaders within the church. And then you turn here to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and you see him first talking about the qualifications for overseer, and then talking about the qualifications for deacon. And so today we're going to be focusing on that first office, the office of overseer, verse 1 to 7. And then next week we're going to look at the office of deacon, verse 8 to 13. And then as I said, the week after that we'll move into our Christmas series and then come back to the end of 1 Timothy chapter 3 after Christmas. So look in your, your Bible then at verse 1 there in chapter 3. And you see him talking about overseer, the office of overseer. The Greek word is episkopos. It's where we get the word episcopalian. And in the King James Version, some of you may even have the King James Version in front of you, it, it translates the word as bishop. But the, the Greek word actually comes from, it has two parts, the word epi, which is for over, and skapos, which is for sight. So this is oversight. This is one who has oversight of a church. And so overseer is a, just a very literal rendering of the original word in Greek. But, but as we think about this idea of oversight, of an overseer of a local church, uh, the New Testament uses different words to refer to this one office. Sometimes it talks about it is an office of the shepherd, of the pastor. It will also use the word elder interchangeably. And you see this, uh, for instance, in Titus chapter 1, which is one of the other key passages for the qualifications for this office. Paul begins by talking about the qualifications for elders. And then just a few verses into it, he starts calling them overseers. And so there's not two offices of overseer and elder, uh, but there is one office, the office of elder, which the Greek word for that is presbyteros, from where we get the word Presbyterian. So Episcopalians and Presbyterians are represented in the words. But what we see here is, is one office. And, and before we actually dive into the text to look at the qualifications, I just want to make two more brief observations about this office of overseer, of elder, from Scripture. And so the first thing to really notice is that the New Testament envisions not just one elder or one overseer leading a local church, but a, a group of elders. Uh, sometimes it's called a plurality of elders. And this is the pattern that you see, for instance, in the book of Acts, where the Apostle Paul would plant a church. You'd go into an area, preach the gospel, gather people around the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments. But then before he would move on from that church he would appoint elders within the church. Again, not just one elder, but a group of elders working side by side to lead the local church. For instance, in Acts 14.23, it says that Paul and his companions appointed elders for them in every church. Again, a group of elders. Or when Paul writes to Titus in Titus chapter 1, he says, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remains in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Now remember that Titus, or sorry, Timothy is an elder in the church of Ephesus. And in Acts chapter 20, Paul actually addresses the elders in Ephesus before he leaves the city. And so again, there wasn't just one, but this plurality, this group of elders. And so we said that there, there is a, a group of elders. That's the first observation for the New Testament. But the second observation is that the New Testament envisions 
really two classes of elder within the church. And we'll, we'll get to this in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, but it says that let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and in teaching. And so in other words, that in what Paul is saying is that among elders, that there, there's a, a ruling function, an exercising authority function of elders within the church. But he says that of those elders, certain elders labor in preaching and teaching especially. And then he goes on to say how it's okay for them to get paid for their work as vocational pastors. Uh, in, in our own denomination, in the Presbyterian church, we have one office of elder. And that's one thing I really actually love about Presbyterian church government is there's, there's no hierarchy. Once you're ordained as an elder, no one has a higher rank or a lower rank. No one gets more of a vote. Uh, whether you're a prominent, famous pastor of a church or you are a lay elder in a small church somewhere, that you have the same ecclesiastical authority. You have the same vote because there was this one office. But within the office, there are teaching elders and ruling elders. So the, the teaching elders are typically the vocational elders who preach the word, administer the sacraments. And then the ruling elders are typically lay elders who also have a pastoral role in the church and who work along with the, the teaching elder. And even our committees always have to have a balance of teaching and ruling elders because that itself is something that holds the church accountable, that it's, it's not just the people who are getting paid who are making the decisions, uh, but that there are, are godly elders who are making the decisions uh, who, who are not getting paid, but who are also having that shepherding role in the church. As we think about that, then this is part of the reason that this passage is especially relevant for us as a church plant. Because currently, I work with a provisional session, so teaching and ruling elders from other churches in our region, but we don't have our own elders yet. We're in that phase that you see in the book of Acts where church is being planted and so the, the desire for hope in the future will be to identify candidates for elder, where somebody will be identified, there's nominations, uh, those men are then examined on their views of theology, uh, their, view, their Christian experience, uh, their understanding of the Bible, and then are ordained and installed to the office of elder. That's something that we're, we're praying for, that we're longing for, that we're looking forward to as a church. And it will be important for us as a church to be able to recognize what a faithful elder looks like. What are the qualifications of an elder? But I also think that this passage, I mean, if you're watching online and you're not part of Hope Church, or if you're visiting and you're part of another church, this passage is relevant not just for elders and pastors who need to know what the standard is, um, not just for people who are going to be nominating elders, but for every single Christian. Because what we're seeing here in this, this list is not something that is just unique to pastors and elders. That this is overwhelmingly a list of character traits that ought to be true for every single faithful Christian in the church. So this is not, there's not two standards, one for ministers, one for elders, and one for other Christians. If this is the standard, the picture of what it is to be a faithful Christian living out our faith, but it becomes especially important for leaders because of the, the spiritual havoc that can be reaped if they fall short of these in profound ways. So with all that in mind, then let's dive into our text. And we're going to look at the, the calling, the character and the competency from this text, the character, the calling, the character, and the competency of an elder in the church. And so the first thing is the calling of an elder. So look again there at verse 1. He says, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. And so even though the, the Bible says that, that in the book of James that not many should be teachers, that those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. He's still saying that if somebody desires to serve in this office, that they're, they're desiring something that is good, that it, it's, a, it's a good desire. And it's important also to, just as a reminder of what we talked about last week, um, I, and, I, and I say that 
that men who aspire to this office, because in the, in the passage right before, Paul had talked about uh, that the, the preaching and the teaching, the exercising authority in the church should be in the context of the worship service, church discipline, the offices of the church um, is for men within the church, rooting that in the order of creation. But we also see it here in the form of the word in the ESV, it's translated anyone, uh, but in, in Greek, it's actually the, the masculine form of that word. So the way the NASB translates it, or the King James Version, is, is really solid. That any man who aspires to the office of overseer seeks a noble task. But then as we, as we look here at this, this aspiration to this office, it's, it's what we could call an internal call to ministry. Uh, this, this internal desire to take up this oversight role within the church. And this internal calling, this internal desire is important for the office. That it, it's not something that somebody should be forced into. Uh, actually, Peter tells the elders in, in 1 Peter 5 that they should shepherd the flock of God that is among them, exercising oversight, there's the oversight idea, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. That it's, it's a willing thing. Uh, you're not being forced into it. You're aspiring to it. And that's also why in verse 10 of, our, of chapter 3, which we'll get into more next week, talks about the deacons being examined first and then let them serve. And that's true for elders as well, that there's this testing period, though, to make sure that, that this internal call is actually legitimate, that, that it's being confirmed by the character of the person who's aspiring to it, and that it's being recognized by the church. And that's what's often called an external call to ministry. So it's both internal and external being recognized. And that's why if you look at verse 6 in our, in our text today, he says that somebody who aspires to this office should not be a recent convert. Because often what will happen is somebody will, will come to faith in Jesus, they'll, they'll repent and believe, and they have this passion, this excitement about their faith, which is so infectious. And, I, and I've seen this many times where people will put their faith in Jesus and then immediately think, I want to be a pastor I'm because I want to learn the Bible, I want to serve. And there again, Paul would say that, that you aspire to a noble task. But he's saying, first be tested. First live out your life in, in the local church. First serve first see if that internal feeling of a call to the office is actually legitimate by this objective confirmation from the church both internal and external and so as we say this then you you can see how this is relevant for somebody considering ministry or, or somebody wondering if they should continue in ministry do they still feel called to the work if they don't feel called they probably shouldn't be serving but you say, well, how is this relevant for others in the church, for people who may not be called to the office of, of elder or the office of deacon? And I think that what we see here in verse 1 is a principle for every believer within the church. According to the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter, or sorry, verse 11, chapter 4, verse 11, he says that the, God gave shepherds and teachers to the church to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And so he's saying then that, that ministry, the call to ministry, is not something that is unique to men or women or to just only certain people, but he's saying that that is actually ministry is the calling of every single believer within the church. And the role of a, of a teacher, of an elder within the church, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so if you are a believer in the church, you are called to ministry, but that may not be an ordained office within the church, like elder or deacon, uh, depending on how God has gifted you, but we're all called to serve, all called to, to build up the body of Christ. But then you consider the giftings that God has given you, and God has given many different gifts that come in different shades and, and forms. And some of them are, are just these fledging gifts that need to be developed over time. But your desire is important in that 
sense of call of the specific way that you serve. Is it with children? Is it to teach? Is it administrative? Is it working with the poor? Is it showing hospitality? The list could go on and on. That, but in that often it starts with this internal sense of this is what I want to do. But then there's that external confirmation where those gifts are tested and those are maybe affirmed or maybe not affirmed in the, the life of the church in that we, we find this sweet spot in our desire to serve and to do the work of ministry in the life of the church when our desire of different ways of serving lines up to this recognition and this affirmation from the church, from this external sense of serving in this way, the opportunity. Uh, and so this is, this is, again, where we aspire, but we are tested first. And so, again, this is the, the calling of an elder, and by extension, the calling of all believers, and this principle that applies to each and every one of us. So, again, this is the calling. But now let's move on from the calling of an elder to the character of an elder. As I think about character, I, I remember a, a class in my first year in seminary where the professor was asking the students training to be teaching elders within the church to reflect on pastors who were influential in their own lives. And as people wrote different things, or sorry, as people shared, he would write it down on the board. And so we, we shared for a while, and it was, it, it was interesting because most of the things that people listed had a lot more to do with character. People said, well, this person really loved me, or this person took time for me, or this people person noticed me when no one, no one else did, or, or when I hung out with this person, I saw behind the scenes of what a godly home looks like or what it looks like to, to pray. And so after everything was on the board, the professor pointed out, just, just look here as you're thinking about vocational ministry, that the big thing that you're listing has to do with character, not competency. Because what people weren't saying is, well, my, my pastor was this amazing visionary leader, or my pastor was so smart, or my pastor was so organized, or my pastor preached the best sermons that I've ever heard. He's the best preacher in the world. That, that quite often when people would admit, yeah, this, this pastor who was really influential in my life, he wasn't Tim Keller, he wasn't John Piper, he wasn't Alistair Begg, he wasn't the, the greatest, best preacher who ever walked the face of the earth. But yet he was faithful, he loved me, he cared for me, he shared the gospel with me, he encouraged me. And that is the very heart of the role of ministry. That's what an elder is for. And that's why Paul here overwhelmingly focuses on character. So let's walk through very briefly some of these character traits that Paul lists. So the first one you'll see there is to be above reproach. The second, he says, is to be the husband of one wife. And in, in Greek, that literally is a one a woman man. Uh, and, and so it, th that means that it, it's somebody who isn't sleeping around, somebody who isn't addicted to pornography, somebody in their context who's not a polygamist that has one wife, the husband of one wife. Um, it, it's not saying that, that somebody couldn't, say, have been, had a spouse die and be remarried. Um, it's not saying necessarily that somebody who had a biblical divorce couldn't be in the office of elder. But it's saying that, 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 that there has to be this pattern of faithfulness within marriage. And we know this. I mean, that's the reason that when people even run for president, often marital infidelity is brought up because people understand, even in the secular world, that that if you're not faithful to your spouse, if you're not faithful to your wife, are you going to be faithful to others? Are you going to really keep your promises if you couldn't even keep it in that crucial relationship of marriage? And just as a side note as well here with this being husband of one wife, he's not saying that you have to be married to be an elder, but it's saying that you, you can be married. And so this is really contrary to what you see in the Roman Catholic Church where pastors where priests are not allowed to get married if they are going to serve. That here, somebody can be a, a pastor leading in the church and be married. But then third, moving on, look at your Bible. It says that an elder should be sober-minded. 
The Greek word literally means very moderate in the drinking of alcoholic beverages. And fourth, an elder should be self-controlled. And that's the idea of self-controlled in drink and food, self-controlled in the way that you organize your life, that this could be the ability to make promises to yourself and then keep those promises. But then fifth, an elder should be respectable. You'll remember that this is the same word that was used of women back in chapter 2, verse 9, to be respectable. And it's defined as having characteristics or qualities that evoke admiration or delight. Then six, an elder should be hospitable. I think it's fascinating that he puts hospitality right here in the qualifications of elders. I know that in the ordination process for teaching elders that this is often overlooked. We focus on many other things, but, but do we focus on, on this? The, the word for hospitality actually is, has two parts, uh, the word philo for love and the word xenos for stranger. And so it's very literally the, the love of strangers. And so you can think of, in our language, the word xenophobia is the, the fear of strangers. And so this is Philoxenia, this is the, the love of strangers, which is such a, a beautiful picture of what hospitality is, that it's, it's inviting people into our lives, it's being welcoming, it's opening our homes to people who are different, people who are in need. It's not trying to just kind of maintain our own space apart from others. And so it's not just the, the kind of hospitality that we think about of a, a perfect home, but it is welcoming in the stranger, this key qualification for elders in the church. And then seventh, moving on as you look at your Bible, an elder shouldn't be a drunkard. In other words, that's saying he shouldn't be addicted to alcohol. And it's the other side of the same coin from being sober that we saw a minute ago. But, of course, you could extend that beyond alcohol to other substances, that he shouldn't be addicted to substances, that there should be this ability, this um, control as they lead within the church. And that doesn't mean that they can never have a drink. The Bible doesn't condemn drinking per se, but drunkenness and the abuse of drugs or alcohol. But then eighth, it says he shouldn't be violent. That could also be translated a bully. And you can, you can think of some of the, the examples that I gave at the beginning about pastors who have flamed out of ministry was through bullying behavior, intimidating people on their staff, intimidating people in, in their church, trying to, to strong arm people into doing what they want. But, he, but Paul's saying, no, that, that somebody who is a leader within the church should not be a bully, should not be violent. But ninth, it says that an elder should be gentle. And in Greek, that word means not insisting on every right of letter of law or custom. And I found that as an interesting definition of that word because it's saying that, that, it, that you might, there might be a, a, a rule, but you're not going to always insist on the rules. And that doesn't mean that you're, you're trying to skirt what is right, but it's this idea of overlooking an offense, of being gracious to people, of being gentle to towards people, the word can also be translated gentle, kind, or tolerant. That this idea of tolerance, not in the the secular sense, but in a very biblical sense, this biblical tolerance. But then 10th, it says an elder shouldn't be quarrelsome. Or you could also translate it, they should be peaceable. And that doesn't mean that an elder can't argue about doctrine in in a godly way. Paul tells elders in Titus chapter 1, that they should be able to teach sound doctrine and to rebuke those who contradict it. And that may sometimes seem quarrelsome or argumentative. But he's saying that that those who serve as elders within the church should be spiritual warriors of the gospel, but that they shouldn't be some kind of a, a spiritual thug who goes around trying to pick fights with other people. And sadly, that can often be the case of people who externally care about theology, that they're trying to constantly pick arguments and fight over every little detail. And then Paul's saying that's not the mark of somebody who should be an elder. But then 11th, moving on, he says an elder shouldn't be 
a lover of money. And that's one I struggled with a bit this week of, well, I think you know when somebody's a bully or when somebody's violent, but how do you know when somebody's a lover of money? How can this actually be a qualification? And I think that it's not so much talking about somebody's income. It's not so much talking about the house that they live in. But I think it's dealing with, are they somebody who uses the money that God has given them to serve others? Are, are they generous? Do they act like their, their money is what counts? Is it, is it money what defines people? And this is where many churches actually fall into a, a hole when they're thinking about especially lay elders within the church, that there, there's this pattern sometimes where when, when a church is selecting an elder, they, they look for the person who is the most successful in business. And so it's, it's more of in the world's eyes, who do you want on your board if you're running a, a business? Well, you might want somebody who's wealthy and successful so that they can give money to the organization. And what that's saying is that that's not the standard that you're looking for in church leadership, that you're not looking at, at money, you're not looking, but you're actually looking for the way that they're, they're not living for money, that they're, they're living to, to share and to give and to, to support others. But then 12, looking again at your Bible, he says that an elder should be a faithful leader in his home. It says that he should manage his own household well, and if he doesn't, how will he manage the household of God? And so this isn't saying that, that the, the children of pastors or, or elders will always be, be perfect. It says that the children should be kept in, in submission. I know some people who grew up as pastors' kids that there can be a lot of pressure that is put on you because, or even the, the, the father putting pressure on the, the ch- child, you know, like, well, I'm a pastor, and so you have to be in submission or I'm going to lose my job, which is not the right way. It's because we want to serve the Lord. But what it's saying here is that there needs to be this this pattern of managing and caring for the household well. Is is religion talked about in the home? Is there a pattern of of prayer and of family worship? And is there this desire to see the child come to faith, to know the Lord, to to grow in holiness, to to really follow the things of of the word? And, and it's not, and sometimes in an old-fashioned view of ministry, it's that you, you sacrifice your family on the altar of ministry because it's a high calling of the Lord. But really what Paul's saying here is that, no, if the starting place is caring for your family and really it's desiring to disciple them and see them grow in the Lord and see them grow in holiness, and if you're doing that, then hopefully that will overflow in the way that you will lead the church, that, that care and leadership in the home needs to be in place first before somebody steps into the office. But then finally, here's the the final character attribute here, that he says that it should be someone who is well thought of by outsiders. I found that as very remarkable as well, that that Paul cares about the way that this person is perceived by outsiders, people outside of the church. Now, of course, he was at a time where Christians were being lied about, were being persecuted, were being murdered, or were being accused of all kinds of terrible things. So he's not saying that, that it means that you're just perfectly always loved by everyone and never misunderstood. But as I was thinking about it, I think that you could almost put, summarize this whole list in, in three different ways. If you wanted to get at the heart of what's going on in somebody, maybe you could think about this in your own life as well. The, the first person you want to talk to is the wife or talk to the spouse. What does the wife or the spouse think of the person if they're really being honest? The second person you need to talk to is the children. What is the person really like in the way that they're leading the home? And then the third person that you need to talk to is the neighbor. How is this person as a neighbor? How is this person, if you're living next to them, if you're doing business with this person, that, that they shouldn't bring shame or dishonor on the name of Christ? And that is what Paul is getting at here. And so these are the, the character qualifications, and much more could be said about them. Now, as Grace and I were, were driving over today, I was commenting that, that it's really scary for pastors to preach on the qualifications for, for elders because you run into two big dangers. The, the one danger would be to say, well, this is me, clearly, because I'm leading this church, which is pride, which disqualifies you from ministry. Um, and, and then the, the other reaction would be to say, 
because I think we all can look at this to some degree and see the ways that we fall short, that, that, I, that there is no perfect elder, no perfect pastor, that, that I fall short in all of these ways, and in, in, in hopefully not in persistent ways or huge ways, uh, but, but we all see our, our failures, our, our, our limitations. But I think that this is exactly, especially as a leader, what I need. Because even though I recognize, yes, I, I'm a sinner who falls short in different ways, that there is an extreme weight on somebody who is leading a church, who's serving as an office bearer within the church. Because if I were to, in a, in a very flagrant way, become someone who is not representative of this list, then that would not only damage me, it would not only damage my family, but it would damage you. It would, it would, be a, it would be a, cause spiritual damage to those in the church. And I feel that even pastoring a, a small church plant, but especially if you think of someone leading a large church or a large ministry, how much damage could be done if they were unfaithful to their wife or if they mishandled money within the church or if they... they burned out their, their family and ministry, all the different ways that, that, that you could go wrong in terms of these qualifications. And that should scare me. That should be terrifying. That should be sobering because we see the danger. But also, I think, as you reflect on your life reading this, it's what I mentioned earlier, that there are not two standards, one for the pastor or for the elder the overseer, and one for everybody else. That's where even I was mentioning the hard experience of pastor's kids, sometimes within churches, from pastor's kids that I've known throughout the years, is that, that when it's a good experience, it's this sense of like, no, we, we want all the children to, to learn to obey their parents. This is a standard for everyone, that we want everyone to manage and care for their family. We want everybody to be peaceable. We don't want anyone to be quarrelsome. We want everyone to... I mean, just go down the list, above reproach, faithful in marriage, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, managing the household well, keeping the children in submission, maintaining good reputation among outsiders. That This is the aspiration for each and every one of us, whether we are aspiring to the office of overseer or elder or not, that this is the picture of a godly person. This is what we long for. This is what we pray that God will bring forth by the power of the Holy Spirit from our lives as we hold on to Jesus. And so we've looked then at the, the calling and the character of the elder, and by extension, all of us. But then now, third and finally, let's look at the competency of an elder. And I, I mentioned how the vast majority of what we see here is about character. That seems to be the, the emphasis. But it's not that competency doesn't matter. And you say, well, what's the difference between, a, between competency and character? When, and character is actually what we all aspire to as believers and followers of Christ. But even as we look at this chapter, chapter 3, we start to see the, the differences in the way that competency. So the the first thing that really touches more on competency that we see here is being apt to teach, able to teach. And even in chapter 3, it says that the, the overseer should be able to teach. But then when it, we'll go through the qualifications of deacons uh, next week, and we'll see that that's not listed. That a teaching gift is not as much of an issue for somebody who's serving as a deacon as it is for somebody who's serving as an elder, that there can be different gifts, that not everybody necessarily is called to aspire to the role of a teacher. So this is touching on this idea of competency. So, so look there again at verse 2. He says that you should be apt to teach, able to teach, that there should be this sense of someone serving as an elder within the church, that they understand the scripture, that they're able to explain that to others to help equip the saints for the work of ministry. And that's because of the crucial role of teaching within the life of the church. In chapter 4 of this letter, Paul's going to encourage Timothy, and he says, this is what I want you to do until I come back. First and foremost, dedicate yourself to preaching and teaching, to the reading of the word of God, that that is the very heart. And so even as you think about a church that you would look for, 
teaching is huge. Uh, and competency in teaching matters. And so you're not just looking for somebody who is, who is cool. Um, I don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, but <laughs> you're, but you're, looking, you're looking for somebody who is able to teach the word of God, that that is important as you're even discerning the kind of church that you're looking for. Are you going to grow in the word in that church? But then I, I was trying to figure out this week whether there was one area of competency or two I think I settled on one and a half areas of competency that he highlights here. Um, so the, the, the one is teaching, and then the half is what we could call maybe managerial competency, uh, the ability to, to manage, uh, to organize. And I think that is touched on in that idea of managing your household well. That is the, the call of everyone who is leading a household, to care for the family, to, to lead And so that is largely character, 90% about character, because it's something that everybody's called to grow in if they're leading a household. But I do think that there's there's an element of competency there as well, that somebody should be able to teach, but they should also be able to to vision cast, to be able to organize, to be able to, to move people along. And that leadership ability, that managerial ability that can be demonstrated in the home is also important for pastoral ministry, for somebody who's going to serve as an elder within the church, which is why he says that if they're not able to do it there, will they be able to do it others? And so those are the two areas of competency that we're looking at here. But I think for every believer that that we're all called to competency in different areas, not the same ways because we all have unique giftings, but we're called to, to grow all of us in holiness and being more like Christ, but then to look, where's God gifted me and how can I grow and develop that? Then as we wrap up today, I just want you to to notice one last thing here. So we've talked about the character, about the calling, the character, and the competency. But notice the last thing here is how Paul mentions the devil twice in this passage. He says that if, there, if you get a recent convert into ministry too soon, that it could lead to conceit. There's the pride part. Uh, and the conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. But then he also says that if they're not well spot thought of by outsiders, that they'll fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. And this is crucial for all of us to, to remember when we think about leadership within the church that there is this profound dimension of spiritual conflict and spiritual warfare that goes on. That if you are a Christian, if you have repented and trusted in Christ, then you have a target on your back, spiritually speaking, that that there there are evil forces of darkness, spiritual forces that would love to see your marriage crumble, that would love to see you walk away from the church, that would love to see you um, addicted, that would love to see you falling into sexual immorality, that, that there are, are forces of evil. That's why Paul says we don't wage war against flesh and blood, but against principalities. But if there is a target spiritually on the back of every believer, which there is, there is especially a target on the back of every leader within the church. Because it has to do with what I was talking about in the introduction, that that think of the spiritual havoc that someone like Ravi Zacharias uh, abusing women in his ministry, that that has reaches, wreaks spiritual havoc. And so you, you think of the, the time spent for the forces of evil and trying to bring down the church, that if you're going to prioritize resources, okay, you bring down Ravi Zacharias, you damage a lot more people than somebody who's not in a leadership role. And so this is why it's so important to to pray for your pastors, to pray for me as your your pastor, as your elder in this this church, and and pray for elders in other churches as we elect elders. Pray that God will protect leaders from the snare of the devil, from, from falling into the reproach of the devil. Pray this list of qualifications. If you ever want to know how to pray for me or to pray for other pastors in your life, just open to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and pray down this list and pray that that all of the leaders in the church can embody these things because that will protect the church in a very profound way from the reviling of the evil one, from the snare 
of the devil. But then ultimately our, our, our goal that is not to, is to pray for our leaders, but also to remember that our leaders will fall in different ways. You can think of the way Peter failed as a leader, Paul failed as a leader, that, that, that there is no perfect pastor. And that's why if we are looking for the, the pastor or the elder to be Christ, we're going to be disappointed. And that's what will cause the devastation of potentially walking away from the church. But if we remember that, that pastors are just under shepherds, that Christ is the only true shepherd, that, that Christ is the ultimate overseer, he is the one who oversees your soul, Christ is the only one who perfectly lived out all of these qualifications. Christ is the only one who, who will never leave you or forsake you. Christ is the only one that we can have as our firm foundation. And so don't put your ultimate trust in any leader, no matter how godly they may seem, because there's a good chance that they will not be as godly as they ought to be. And that, that our, our ultimate trust is in Jesus, because he's the one who died, no minister no elder died for the church. He is the one who builds the church. He is the one who loves the church. He is the one who will sustain the church to the end, despite all of the wolves in sheep's clothing, despite all of the, the attacks of Satan, that the gates of hell will not prevail against it because Christ ultimately is the one building his church. And that's what we see here in this meal, symbolized and sealed, that, that Jesus is the one who is the foundation. He is our ultimate leader, even as he has under shepherds within the church. Because his body was broken, his blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins. He laid down his life for us. And it's ultimately through faith in Christ, through repenting and trusting in him alone that we have any hope and even any desire, any ability to even begin to try to live out this list starts with admitting we can't do it and trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation and praying for grace to grow in these ways. And thankfully, God uses the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments to strengthen us as we walk with him and by faith. Now, if you're here and you've never repented and trusted in Christ for salvation, we're glad you're here, but we'd encourage you to wait, to not come forward to take this meal, that that would do spiritual damage for you, according to the Bible. And it's similar if you're a believer who uh, had, and you're, you're holding on to some sort of animosity or bitterness towards somebody. It says in Scripture that there are times where you could leave your gift at the altar, be reconciled to your brother, and then come. And so there, there are times where it could even be appropriate for a believer to wait in a particular week in taking this to do business with the Lord. But for the rest, you don't have to be a member of Hope Church. You don't have to be a member of a Presbyterian church but to be one who is trusting in Christ alone for salvation, has made that public by being part of a church that preaches the gospel, by being baptized, by, by making that public profession of, of faith, and to be one who's not coming as one who's strong, but one who's weak, looking to Christ, the great ultimate shepherd of the sheep. And really we come then as one who can profess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. So, Turn to page 7 in your order of worship. <clears throat> 